This meeting is being recorded. Perfect. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're pleased to have Brian James here uh, today to give our MNR. We'll let everyone um, trickle in and, as usual, give a bit of an intro first. Uh, so Brian James will be joining us and presenting on the uh, interferographic TEM, ITEM method, uh, array beamforming for resolution improvement. Um, and as usual, um, we can you can check out uh, the upcoming um, presentations and all of the previous presentations on the uh, MTNet MNRs page. Uh, so there's links for registration for any of the upcoming MNRs. And then um, for speakers who shared their um, slides, uh, you can see those from previous presentations as well as the YouTube links. <coughs> Uh, next week, we have an excellent MNR uh, looking forward to hosting uh, Bulent Tank on electromagnetic studies in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean region with special reference to major transform strike slip faults. Uh, so this will be an EM induction workshop review. So uh, put that on your calendars. And as I mentioned today, we're pleased to have Brian joining us. Uh, so he'll be talking about the ITEM method and we'll give a quick intro to Brian before I turn the screen share over to him. So uh, Brian is the founder of Electromagnetic Geophysical Imaging Solutions, LLC, which began in 2020. Brian has over 20 years of experience in geophysics and 19 years in the US defense industry. EGIS was uh, founded to develop and apply new techniques in electromagnetic surveys and processing to enhance resolution of subsurface targets. The initial result of this development effort is the interferographic TEM method. EGIS uh, looks to develop geophysics <coughs> uh, industry collaborations uh, to bring these new capabilities to complete fruition, demonstrate their technical performance in field tests, partner in the development of commercial ITEM systems, perform ITEM processing for commercial surveys and assist to educate others in entering this technical specialty. And so with that, I will stop sharing and hand it over to Brian. Okay, let me share my screen. Yes, please go ahead. And I will minimize that one. And does everybody see this? No, not yet, Brian. Uh, we'll need you to do the resharing of the screen on Zoom. Okay, I thought I just did that. So that green button at the bottom again, because I stole yep. the screen share from you. <laughs> oh, I got it. I got it. So I didn't complete the process. Now do we, you see me? It's coming up. We'll just give it a second. So I see uh, the Zoom meeting, and now we see the slides. So that looks great. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, after some technical challenges getting started, we're ready to go. Uh, thank you for having me on today to talk about interferographic uh, TEM, which is a new approach to trans EM based on field interference principles to do synthetic beam forming. And I wanna say at the outset, I greatly appreciate the assistance of my co-authors on this effort. So I hope to, uh, complete all the goals I've outlined here. I'm gonna introduce a new concept for TEM surveys and analysis, inspired by techniques from adjacent technical fields. I'm going to show processing results illustrating the resolution achieved for two structural models. And I hope to make clear why we wanna do this as we go along. And my outline is on the right. Uh, so at the top level, this is sort of uh, the preview of everything uh, in here. I'm going to talk about multi-source, multi-receiver methods, which are also known as synthetic aperture and or beam forming, uh, that are established in numerous technical fields such as radar, uh, particularly synthetic aperture radar, RF signal direction finding, radio astronomy, and medical imaging. Note that these are all spatial processing techniques. Interferographic TEM, on the other hand, processes data with a space-time beamforming transformation. The main benefit of this ITEM beamforming is that it achieves significant synthetic compaction of EM field structure in the subsurface, thereby improving spatial resolution for buried targets. 
a nominal uh, approach to a survey would have uh, magnetic field profiles repeated for each of approximately uh, 10 source positions. And as a result uh, of that extra effort, uh, it is best applied with drones in a semi-airborne TEM survey. The sources are on the ground sur surface. The drones help drive down the cost per point while the number of sources drives up the cost, of course. So I think we arrive at a happy uh, uh, medium on this. And the system for terrestrial application would be called Drone Enabled Interferographic Transient Electromagnetics, or DITEM. These multi resource, multi receiver TM data sets, we're able to quickly analyze those into 2D images. And uh, I do expect that eventually the greatest resolutions, uh, the, the resolution gains we will get, will happen from internalizing this sort of processing within 2D and 3D. EM optimization software. A couple of words about my background. I started out in geophysics and uh, then left for uh, 19 years working in the US defense industry. It's in the defense industry where I gained a lot of exposure and insight into other techniques and a great appreciation of cross fertilization of ideas across technical disciplines. Um, after retiring from the defense industry, I came back to geophysics specifically because of the advent of drones and their opening a viable path to do this sort of data intensive concept. I was hearing a lot about drones from Ron Bell and then later on Johannes Stoll, so I jumped in. Okay, let's get to some background on uh, array methods and adjacent technical fields. Interferometry and synthetic apertures both are widely used in a wide variety of wave propagation techniques. Uh, some of the acronyms are uh, SIGINT stands for Signals Intelligence. Uh, SAR of course stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar and GPR stands for Ground Penetrating Radar. These are all wave propagation problems. Um, so to highlight a couple of things, the first figure in the lower left shows basic, the basic approach to doing radio wave interferometry in radio astronomy using path link differences, basically phase differences to do direction finding. The next figure over shows a spotlight mode star light system. An individual SAR beam encompasses an area larger than the scene. A sequence of such collections enables processing to unmix all of the detailed information contained in the raw data. Um, there are also many varieties of medical imaging that exist that use a, a wide range of techniques. It's a very rich field. Specifically, the magnetoencephalogram, or MEG, which is a close relative to the more common EEG, uses a beam forming approach that I have adopted for the TEM problem. MEGs measure magnetic fields around the human skull to locate where currents are flowing in the brain. Okay, so for synthetic apertures in the wave propagation world, this is really what it's about in, 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 a, in a summary form. The concept uses uh, small antenna, numerous small antenna positions sequenced end to end to combine and become a synthetic large antenna. Small antennas by themselves are undesirable since they have very small antenna gain and wide beams. Whereas what we want are large antennas with high antenna gain and narrow beams for spatial resolution. Such large antennas are often too large to actually build and field. Hence the synthetic aperture concept, which is purely spatial since wave propagation creates time separation of returns from different ranges. It achieves nearly complete unmixing of signal returns and it provides very high resolution beamforming. Okay, there is a little bit of prior work in EM geophysics with synthetic apertures. Uh, two PhDs were done at the Colorado School of Mines under Rule Sneeder, and th they demonstrated that uh, synthetic apertures can in fact be applied to EM geophysics. They did this for the frequency domain marine CSEM context. 
and it required a reference model and they were focused on uh, a single layer in that medium and uh, they show did show signal enhancement for that for a potential pay zone uh, some antenna gain enhancement is therefore uh, demonstrated and possibly some slight narrowing of the antenna beam pattern, but that's not clearly specified. They have little to say on the subject of spatial resolution. Um, later on, following uh, the... Uh, ...started working on this subject, and they have more recently, uh, in 2020, uh, uh, greatly improve the techniques involved in this. And they do talk about spatial resolution in a little bit, but mostly relative to the original uh, uh, techniques. And they do look at multiple frequencies now for looking at different, different depth slices. However, there are issues when it comes to um, using synthetic apertures in the context of diffusion physics. So the, the issue with applying synthetic apertures to TEM diffusion in particular is signal sources are everywhere. There's no clear wavefront for time separation of returns from different parts of the medium. Only steady variation of signal sources versus time that smears everything out for a given location over a substantial time range, which is greatly overlapped with signal sources at other locations. In other words, we have highly mixed and overlapped information. The graphic gives you an example of how uh, widely spread the, the uh, signal is in the earth. This is the electric field on a vertical plane uh, uh, perpendicular to a wide directed source, uh, grounded wire source. It happens to be at 355 milliseconds for a uniform half space model. So the question is, uh, can TEM data be unmixed before analysis and to what degree? After all, SAR and reflection seismology processing do this unmixing very well. Whereas with TEM, it has received very little attention. The, the synthetic aperture concept, I believe, is at best an incomplete technique for um, TEM diffusion and signal unmixing. EM geophysics with its time varying field evolution stands out as a technical discipline in which to date no signal unmixing process is performed prior to detailed analysis. It has always been assumed to be impossible because of diffusion physics. A lot could be gained by pursuing such pre-analysis unmixing such as improved resolution. Okay, let's go at this slightly differently. In wave propagation, beam forming is specifically accomplished with synthetic apertures. To be clear, the synthetic aperture is the means and beam forming is the end, meaning the real goal. So for diff TEM diffusion physics, let's just focus on beam forming itself. Beam forming is achieved by interfering different field instances together to constructively add signals where desired and destructively cancel signals everywhere else. The graphic shows uh, a classic little example of, of uh, interfering in constructive and destructive ways. On the left, you have two sine waves that are aligned and when added, they give you a larger sine wave on the left, that's constructive interference on the right, your two sine waves are 180 degrees out of phase, so when you add them, they cancel completely. That's your destructive interference. So, um, the proposal really is this. For TEM, let's use a set of reference model subsurface electric field distributions for n sub s source positions and n sub, c, n sub t times. We're going to use time as a proxy for z in this. So we use this set of uh, distributions basically as basis functions to construct synthetic impulsive E-field distributions in the subsurface. And I call this interferography for the TEM diffusion case as opposed to interferometry for interference of waves. And this is really to simply avoid confusion between, among terms. So, 
Pictorially, it's going to look like this. This is one of uh, a couple of slides. Um, the ITEM concept and general survey design is illustrated by this. Um, this example uses just three sources and three times on the left denoted by T1, T2, T3 for the three layers of the um, EM diffusion, uh, electric field diffusion into the earth as a function of time. A typical survey uh, design is shown on the right where it may have about 10 source positions and maybe three to four decades in time with five or more times per decade. And note that the magnetic field profile we're gonna, is going to be flown in its entirety for each source position. The electric field distribution E sub Y for the two dimensional case we're considering shows the spatial translation and field expansion as a function of source position and time respectively. Each of these contains a main positive lobe and a more diffuse negative lobe at it for the return paths in the earth. We'll use all of these current sections for some reference model as basis functions to form a subsurface electric field synthetic impulse. One of these for each grid position. Okay. So this, as we continue from the previous slide, the physics view of what we're doing is we're gonna interfere all of the ensemble of distributions that I was just describing to produce an impulsive distribution centered at any subsurface position. The math view of this is we're doing a two dimensional digital filtering operation, going from source position and time, and we're doing beam forming to create a compact impulse for a specific point X and Z. And we can do this for all X, Z points in our subsurface grid. Last step, uh oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Each um, e, sub, e sub Y filtered, we'll call it distribution you see, um, has uh, a main lobe of high amplitude as well as two dimensional side lobes. And then we remove those side lobes by application of a threshold. And what you're left with is uh, what is shown at the bottom. So, we, we achieve a synthetic concentration of the electric field at every position in the subsurface. And this promises resolution enhancement. And we do achieve partial only, but very significant unmixing of TEM fields by doing this. Okay, and last step with this, uh, the same weights that we calculate to produce the electric field impulsive distributions are also applied to the magnetic field profiles, both reference model and the field data. These filtered profiles also display a main lobe and side lobes. The graphic shows a result associated with a single electric field impulsive distribution at one XZ position in the subsurface. And you repeat all of this for all of your uh, positions in your subsurface grid you have defined. Note that uh, for um, shallower XZ positions in the subsurface, this distribution will look a lot spikier. And for deeper XZ positions, it will, it will spread out a lot more. Okay. Formulation, I don't want to uh, get into the weeds with this. I just wanna give you a summary on this one slide. The calculation of the weights is a space-time digital filter. And I'm describing this for a 2D Earth with a 3D source oriented in the Y direction. The 2D assumptions effectively reduce the EM problem to a scalar form as shown. The computed electric field impulsive distribution on the left side is a, uh, uh, is a, a small, uh, distribution in the XZ plane, a vertical plane, and you have one of those for each grid position, X star, Z star, okay? So each, 
Each of those is distributed in X and Z, but they have a central focal point, which is denoted by X star and Z star. The input electric field distributions on the right side are in X and Z, of course, and one of these for each source position X sub S and time T. The beamformer weights W to be calculated translate these X sub S and T E field distribution inputs into X star, Z star impulsive outputs. The weights uh, are determined by a minimization under constraints formulation using the Lagrange multipliers method. And I've supplied a little uh, a ref uh, reference at the bottom um, on, a, on a paper that I have used quite a bit on MEG beamforming. And the, the derivation he does uh, for this algorithm is functionally identical to uh, my version for the TEM problem. We end up with the, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip all the math having to do with that. It's, it's not uh, good to do in this sort of uh, environment. Um, but we end up with a matrix solution for the set of weights as shown, where the E terms are the set of original electric field distributions and C is the covariance matrix of all of those electric field distributions. This is called a linearly constrained minimum variance or LCMV beamformer. So in short, the weights are the recipe for how to interfere all of the original electric field distributions together to form an impulsive distribution centered on each grid element. So, Here's an example uh, of what the weights will, will look like for a single grid position, okay? And this is near the center of the grid and at a depth of 650 meters. I'm using 13 sources and 41 times in, in this uh, example. The um, two graphics on the left side show weights as a function of source position for various times. X axis is the source position, Y axis is the uh, uh, interferographic weight value. The upper graph shows three consecutive times from seven to 11 milliseconds. The lower graph shows three consecutive times from 70 to 110 milliseconds. Note how the weights are more localized in source position at earlier times and spread out further at later times. Also, we have very large weight amplitude differences between the two graphs. The scale uh, in the upper left is from minus 40 to plus 20, whereas down below uh, the scale is, is minus six to plus six. So a much smaller amplitude in comparison to those that are closer to the cell uh, we're considering. Looking at sets of three times also illustrates the degree of weight variation as a function of source position and time. Now the two graphs on the right show weights as a function of time now for sets of three source positions. Y axis now is time and the X axis is our interferographic weight value. The upper graph shows the weights for the source in immediate proximity to the grid point in blue and two other sources at positions moving away, black then red. Notice the amplitudes of the weights getting much smaller. The lower graph shows the weights as source position continues to move away, blue then black then red, and the amplitudes continue to uh, recede in, uh, in value. Do note the variations in scale again between the two, two displays. With these, we again see large changes in weight values. The significant weights are spread over about three decades in time, with the dominant time frame being about two decades. Collectively, these weights form a space-time digital filter. The set of weights achieves constructive and destructive interference to create a synthetic impulse of distribution output. And we do this for each and every grid cell location in our grid. And these weights are unique for each of these XZ positions. Now that we have those weights, here's our example um, 
for the electric field distribution in the lower panel and the magnetic field profile in the upper panel. So these are what, what would be the filtered results at this point. Again, we're looking at a point near the middle of the grid and at a depth of 650 meters. We see a main lobe surrounded by low amplitude 2D side lobes in the electric field distribution. We then apply a threshold at one half of the maximum amplitude, which is 3 dB in the decibel system. And the inset shows the limited extent of the high amplitude core of the main lobe remaining after thresholding. In the upper panel, Note that the magnetic field profiles, both reference and uh, acquired field data, are, subject, are subjected to the same weights, resulting in the filtered impulsive shape profiles shown. The y-axis is logarithmic, hx is in blue, and hz is in black. hz is anti-symmetric and therefore not as clearly useful. We're going to focus mostly on hx. Now I would like to compare directly uh, the original and the synthetic interferographic distributions and, and really uh, look at the amount of compaction we have achieved. The lower panel shows the, our ITEM result for the same position we've been considering and the result after applying the half amplitude threshold. The upper panel shows an original uh, e sub y time slice at 355 milliseconds for the source position at x equals zero when the maximum of EY is at a depth of 650 meters. The arrows show the width of the uh, greater than half amplitude part of that distribution. The degree of compaction achieved by the digital filter is approximately a factor of six. And the table in the upper right shows other compaction factors at other depths. Note that it increases with depth. Also, uh, such reduction in spatial bandwidth implies processing gain is achieved, which is always a good thing. By processing gain, uh, uh, an, uh, an example which uh, most people are probably familiar with would be that that's achieved in the in the FFT of a time series. It, let's say you have a sine wave buried in noise and you have a 2000 point FFT. The processing gain is equal to 10 times the uh, log of N over two. So basically a uh, thousand, the log of that is three times 10, gives you 30 dB of processing gain. So when I talk about the degree of compaction spatially we're getting, we are achieving some level of processing gain, just like I've laid out how, how it occurs for the FFT. Okay, what do we do from here? All we've got right now are, are filtered E sub Y distributions for a reference model and filtered H sub X profiles for a reference model and our acquired data. We don't yet have a geoelectric product. There's, so there's two ways to go from here. We can use the beam forming results to directly develop a resistivity image section, which is what I will uh, proceed to do from here. The other path is to internalize the interferographic processing into 2D or 3D optimization software. I believe this is the eventual best path providing the greatest resolution improvements, but obviously this lies in the future. All right, some observations uh, before we actually uh, get into the imaging algorithm. Um, we have our filtered products. Each uh, E sub Y F, F for filtered distribution in the 2D case only, represents a bundle of long filaments perpendicular to the vertical plane, so in the Y direction. The H, X, uh, F profiles the filtered profiles are nearly symmetric across the element position and optimally coupled to these Y-directed filaments. HZF instead is anti-symmetric with a zero crossing over the element position, and we will not use these. As a first order approximation, the ratio of HX acquired to HX reference 
varies directly with the conductivity difference of the element bundle associated with it. This relationship will gradually fail as the ratio departs more and more from unity. And so all of this is the basis of a fairly straightforward uh, resistivity imaging algorithm. I've got two slides that takes you through this short algorithm, but before I do that, I wanna point out there's actually two grid notations involved here that the two grids are identical in scope. The IX and IZ um, notation denotes the grid position for the interferographic processing result. This would be the point at the center of the distribution shown in the lower right. The KX and KZ grid contains the output distribution itself for each of those IX, IZ positions. We're doing the same for the HX profile. Also KX and KZ will be, okay. So step one, we're gonna just compute a simple residual being uh, the HXF acquired minus the HXF reference. And that difference we're going to divide by the reference. Do this point by point in the KX uh, uh, grid notation. This is repeated for every IX and IZ um, um, interferographic processing result. These residual values, of course, can be plus or minus. Now we're going to compute two estimates of some E field of each element in the su subsurface using our filtered uh, E field, uh, uh, the filtered reference distributions, as well as these residuals we've just calculated for every IX and IZ. As a reminder, the filtered electric fields have very limited non-zero range in KX and KZ after thresholding. So any given element in KX and KZ will have non-zero values and only a small number of impulsive distributions in close proximity to that cell. Keeping that in mind, we define these two accumulators. A sub E will just be the summation of all these distributions over all IX and IZ. The A sub R uh, accumulator is done the same way, except that each term in the summation is multiplied by the residual value for the uh, magnetic fields we calculated uh, for the corresponding KX position. So whatever the magnetic field value is directly above. All right. Uh, at this point, we then ratio the two accumulators, A sub R over A sub E. And we're going to end up with what I call delta J, which means exactly what we think. It is an estimated change in current in each subsurface cell relative to the reference case. It can be positive, indicating higher conductivity or lower resistivity, or it can be minus, indicating lower conductivity or higher resistivity. And then lastly, we produce a resistivity estimate for a given cell, uh, mostly using the first formula, which uh, you look at the denominator there, it is our simple linear assumption, one plus delta J. But as is uh, very apparent, uh, if delta J gets to minus one, you have a singularity. And if it becomes even more negative, then you have, quote, negative resistivities. All of this is very problematic and nonsensical, of course. So uh, as we approach those troublesome values, we change equations. And there, all I've done is, is raised uh, delta J um, to the power of 10. So 10 to the power of delta J. And I do the switch over between these two formulas at the value of delta J equals zero point, minus 0 0.8628. Um, this is the value, one of the values, but it's the one we're, we're focused on, where these two denominators are equal. So that value is where one plus delta J equals 10 to the delta J. So in the end, we're, we have a mostly linear uh, uh, mapping, but it, as the delta J values become increasingly negative, the mapping becomes nonlinear. 
Okay, so let's produce some resistivity images. We're gonna consider two structural cases for testing ITEM processing. The baseline structure is a two layer medium, 10 ohmeters over 100 ohmeters and a layer depth of 500 meters. One model is a buried basin, 10 ohmeter fill down to a depth of 1100 meters. The other is a buried horst, 100 ohmeter basement uplifted to a depth of 200 meters. I'm choosing a large scale problem uh, intentionally as this is a target problem set in my opinion for ITEM surveys. So um, I've got the simulated survey parameters on the right. Our drone is flying at an altitude of 10 meters. The entire flight line is 9,600 meters, 13 source positions separated by 800 meters. The grounded wires in the Y direction are 1,000 meters long. My uh, uh, delta X spacing for the grid is 100 meters, while the grid uh, Z spacing is variable. Uh, small size near the surface, greater size at depth. And I'm looking at a time range of about 0.1 milliseconds to one second for this geoelectric case. Um, you could get away with three decades in time as long as it is the right three decades. You have to make sure you've got uh, the first and last times carefully chosen so, so that you have uh, the correct time coverage. All right, the first example uses a simple 10 ohmeter half space as the reference model. In this case, a half amplitude or 3 dB threshold uh, was applied in the, in the, uh, at the end of the filtering operation. The basin model is on the left, the horse model is on the right. The upper figure in each is a resistivity image. The resistivity scale is five to 75 ohm meters. The lower figure is a percent change image and percent change is with respect to the reference resistivity value for that element. The percent change scale is plus and minus 100% for the basin and plus and minus 200% for the horse. The structures that were modeled uh, for my simulated uh, uh, field data is overlain in white. So um, sort of a summary uh, of, of the results achieved. Lateral position of the image structure is, is good for both. The vertical position of the image layers and the structure itself, uh, I would say is too deep. Um, the shape is pretty good for the horse, but less so for the basin, which seems to mostly produce an anomaly of the anomalous structure. The anomaly resistivities themselves, of course, in an imaging scheme like this are greatly subdued relative to the true values. There's gradations and artifacts in these as well, but they are all in the right direction becoming more resistive at where we go from conductive overburden to resistive basement, et cetera. And then lastly, for artifacts and noise, um, we see some things in the near surface that relate to the source separation. We have things in the moderate at moderate depths and we definitely have some edge effects. Next, I wanna show you uh, the, for the same uh, reference model, a 10 ohmeter half space, I wanted to show you a result with a uh, different threshold. And this is a 10 dB threshold, an order of magnitude. Um, so one tenth of the maximum value, which captures just about all of the impulsive distribution main lobe. So it's quite a bit larger than the half amplitude version. Mostly we get similar results. The, the spatial information hasn't changed much. It has become smoother. And the resistivity values and the percent change, of course, uh, are much subdued relative to the 3 dB case. So more or less choosing a, a lower threshold so that we carry a larger distribution uh, into our imaging, it pretty much just acts as a smoothing filter. And I think we'll dispense with that. Let's change models. The reference model is now the base two layer model. And we've gone back to the 3DB uh, threshold here. 
So 10 ohmmeters over 100 ohmmeters and a 500 meter depth. The number one takeaway is how poorly the image turned out for the basin structure. The anomaly projected way too deep. And I believe the issue is the reference model. And I'll talk about that a little bit mo more shortly. Um, so again, lateral position though is good for both. The vertical position of the image structure, pretty good for the horse, quite poor for the basin. The shape, again, fair for the horse, not so for the basin. The resistivity values, again, are in the right direction, subdued just as before. And same sorts of things going on in terms of artifacts and noise. The edge effects seem to be fewer, um, but so that's a little bit improved. Okay, so since the two layer reference model was problematic for us, which is a little bit of a surprise in some respects, I've investigated the use of gradual layered models with steadily increasing resistivity with depth. The methodology, I'm gonna skip over for that, but I've got it in, a, in an extra slide at the, at the back of the, of the PDF uh, file. All in all, these are the best imaging results and a good starting point for inversions. <clears throat> um, lateral position for both is very good, I, I believe. The vertical position, we're still slightly too deep, but really this is about the best we've achieved. The shape for both, I think now you could say is fair for both. Same conclusion for the resistivity values, we're in the right direction. Um, perhaps it's getting a little better. And we certainly like the, the overall shapes that we get out of the resistivity sections. And uh, as always, the, the, we still have artifacts and noise cropping up. Um, okay. In particular, I think the gradations we see in these are reasonable. And as we'll see, they're not very different from inversion results. One big final takeaway is that the imaging results, I think we can clearly see, depends quite a bit on the reference model. Specifically, it seems best to have a reference model that is a little too conductive, such that one is locating resistive anomalies, rather than a reference model that is too resistive, where, we're, where our imaging of con, uh, is of conductive anomalies, which does not turn out as well it would seem. And I think this reflects the inherent bias of EM toward uh, uh, conductors. It also perhaps suggests uh, using different, re different reference models and a uh, meta-analysis approach to get a maximum likelihood or consensus final model. I now want to introduce some random noise into the data to see how the ITEM processing stands up. The upper panels show the original magnetic field profiles at about 1.1 second, the very last time gate. Red is the HX acquired data, green is HZ acquired. The lower profile panel shows the ITEM processed magnetic field profiles for a grid cell at a depth of 1,050 meters. Again, red, red is HX acquired and green is HZ acquired. At the bottom are resistivity images for the buried uh, basin model. This slide shows two cases with the noise floor at 50 dB uh, below peak value on the left and 40 dB below peak value on the right. The 50 dB noise floor case shows that while considerable noise is evident in the original data at 1.1 second, the ITEM magnetic uh, field profile result is still quite solid with few important effects. The image quality is still quite high. All visible changes in the image are at depths in excess of about 1,000 meters. The 40 dB noise floor case on the right shows a complete loss of usefulness in the original profiles at 1.1 second. 
in the ITEM result, there are clearly effects at our position of 1,050 meters deep, but the high amplitude core of the ITEM magnetic field profile is still quite good. The noise effects on the resistivity image are now noticeable and becoming important. However, the image is overall still pretty good, useful, and relatively accurate. Note that a noise floor at 60 dB has negligible effect, while a 30 dB noise floor is fairly ruinous to the ITEM processing result. I have a couple of slides in the extra slides uh, section that document these uh, two other cases, as well as what you would have when, if you simply truncate uh, your data above the noise floor, and that produces a better result. The overall picture is that the ITEM processing results degrade gracefully as the noise floor rises. Its quality may well be better than the original data due to the bit of processing gain I mentioned earlier. That results from the narrowing of spatial bandwidth from the interferographic processing. Okay, let's now see how we compare to uh, 3D EM inversion. We were unsuccessful in our search for acceptable inversion codes for processing our grounded wire results. Uh, therefore, we tested ITEM for loop sources and compared the inversion results using SIMPEG from the University of British Columbia. We again modeled structural cases of buried basin and buried horst, but on a smaller scale than for the grounded wire testing. We, here we use 17 source loop positions of size 40 by 40 meters along a 2000 meter profile. Baseline geoelectric model is still two layers, 10 meters over 100 meters, not, but now with a layer depth of 160 meters. In particular, we are testing the idea of utilizing ITEM results as initial models for costly 3D inversion, in addition to the non-assisted inversions. And I wish to really thank Kyobo No for his excellent help and work uh, on this exercise for us. So the initial models uh, are as shown. The unassisted inversion uh, initial model is a 10 ohm meter half space on the left. The initial models on the right are the ITEM resistivity sections for the two structural cases. Basin model on top, horse model underneath. The structural shapes are seen blended with the gradual resistivity versus depth reference models used in the processing. Note the different resistivity scales. The ITEM horse result is pretty good. The ITEM basin anomaly, on the other hand, is too deep, uh, with very little uh, indication at, at the correct depths. Um, please note that the grounded wire sources do better than the loop sources for the basin case. That requires a little thinking about, I think. Um, the modeled structures used to generate the simulated acquired data are shown by the overlaid white lines. The inversion results for all cases show that the structures were well resolved, with the candidate basin result uh, above um, being quite a bit more smoothed out compared to the resistive horse result on the bottom. Um, the inversions using the 10 meter uh, half space initial model are on the left. The inversions with the ITEM result as the initial model are on the right. The solution convergence plots are on the far right. Do note the resistivity scale for all is now 10 to 100 uh, ohm meters. The inversions as expected do much better at approaching the true resistivities modeled. But we also see gradations quite similar to the ITEM results earlier. Importantly, using the ITEM result as the starting model results in faster convergence and fewer artifacts in the images in comparison to the unassisted inversions. The, either way, the horse result is more crisp and the basin result is more gradational. I would say there's real value using quick ITEM results to improve inversion results, not to mention the real value of using distributed sources and dense data. 
And uh, I'm also very interested in what an internalization of ITIM processing into optimization software could achieve. Now let's focus on resolution. Since ITIM looks to be an improvement in structural resolution, how do we address that in a specific technical way? I talked a bit with Andre uh, uh, about this and as far as I know, no existing baseline methods to describe or measure resolution exist. Uh, so I thought about this and one thing we can do is, is, is the exercise we're gonna do here. In the signal processing world, the common thing to do is to define the minimum separation between two signals where they can be discerned as two signals as opposed to one spread out signal. So let's do this for lateral spatial separation of two anomalous targets. What we're gonna do is on the right, we're gonna run test models for two small conductors at different separations and repeat for three depths. For one source in the original magnetic field data versus time profiles. The time, and we're gonna use the time where the maximum anomaly is seen. We're gonna determine the minimum separation where the two conductors are clearly discernible. For the ITEM processing, we have to wait until we have the image resistivity section. And we're gonna extract a single resistivity uh, uh, versus X profile at the depth of the model targets and determine the minimum separation where the two conductors are clearly discernible. Here's what we get. On the right are the are three cases of the two conductor lateral resolution test for three depths at 175 meters, 350 meters, and 700 meters to the top of the conductors. With each doubling of depth, the dimensions of the conductor also double. So the dimensions are 25 meters, 50 meters, and 100 meters, uh, respectively. The lengths uh, of these conductors in the Y direction is 1,000 meters. A modeling exercise is done for each case where the lateral offset between the two conductors is varied in 25 meter increments. So kind of coarse grain but uh, enough to show us uh, the, the basic results. The profile graphics um, show original HX profiles on the left and ITEM depth slices extracted from the resistivity images on the right. These examples are for the two conductors at a depth of 175 meters. Please note the difference in the conductivity contrast used in the original versus ITEM comparison. I had to increase the contrast uh, for the original data to be able to see it adequately. For the original profiles, the separation of 150 meters shows two peaks, while the separation of 125 meters does not quite. For the ITEM depth slices, the separation of 100 meters shows two peaks, while the separation of 75 meters does not. Similar exercise was done for the other two conductor depths. The results for all three cases are shown in the table at the bottom. The general conclusion is that the current version of ITEM processing and imaging improves lateral resolution compared to the original profiles and with only this uh, course exercise to go by, I would put the relative improvement, uh, meaning a reduction in the minimum visible separation at about 40%. The improvement may well increase with, in, with increasing depth. Not enough uh, has been done yet to determine that uh, uh, clearly. This is just one resolution exercise, but the ITEM result is clearly an improvement for lateral resolution. And I've done no assessment of vertical resolution. I wanna wrap up the resolution piece with just a few comments. Um, the, the, this two target exercise is an example of a quantifiable resolution test, but we need others. Um, we need metrics defining spatial resolution as well as resistivity contrast resolution, et cetera. I think um, this is a subject where um, 
some work could happen in the EM, the academic EM uh, geophysics community to help put together uh, benchmark models and associated technical metrics. I think this would, would help everybody out, both academically and commercially. Um, down below uh, is a different little subject I wanted to bring up, which is uh, Occam uh, approaches, which impose smoothness constraints to address non-uniqueness as well as numerical issues. And these are not I these constraints are not ideal for descriptions of real geology, which is mostly only locally smooth or not smooth at all. And then um, I bring that up because ITEM internalization and optimization software is going to come into direct conflict with these sorts of smoothness constraints. And this will need to be solved to achieve the full gains and resolution possible with ITEM processing. Okay. We're heading towards the finish line here. Discussion points. Field tests are the immediate next step. And it is doable whenever anybody would like. The systems to do so um, exist in some form. On the, in the upper right, I show an existing uh, system uh, Johannes Stoll uh, uses, uh, his shallow EM system. We can do ITEM with either grounded wire or loop sources. I think we need to establish the problem areas for application of ITEM. In my opinion, those are the deep and structural problems. Um, but in, in general, you could say any problem that is not well solved with existing capabilities, be it geophysics or drilling, uh, those problems as well, uh, such as monitoring that could always benefit from improved resolution. And then also if computing resources for inversions are a bottleneck, ITEM imaging is a worthwhile alternative. And I would say lastly on this slide that commercial success uh, will depend on well-optimized system and field practices and the use of drones. Uh, the second part of the discussion is, I, one of my big goals is to attract others into working with interferographic TEM. If in the end, um, I'm the only one doing this, then I view that as a bad outcome. ITEM achieves partial, though significant, unmixing of TEM fields. There's likely a range of theoretical and practical improvements to the present methodology that are, that are possible. Um, full integration into EM optimization software, which is the eventual best solution, in my opinion, is still to be done, as well as a full 3D interferographic formulation. And I'd like to, to end the discussion with, with this bold statement. With the interferographic TEM framework, we can systematically probe the limits of achievable resolution, as well as engineer the electromagnetic field structure to suit our needs. Traditional uh, conclusion slide, I'll, I'll go through this uh, quickly. Uh, we've talked about the value of multiple source, multiple receiver systems. Uh, we've talked about uh, EM spatial resolution improvements from interferographic TEM that synthetically compacts uh, EM field structure into impulsive distributions. And it is doing this with an LCMV beamformer algorithm, a space-time digital filtering technique that has not been used before in, geo in EM geophysics. Partial though significant uh, TEM field unmixing is achieved. In bold, ITEM resistivity image result depends on the reference model used. And this will be uh, an important study area going forward, I think. The good news is we can do this very quickly uh, for quick turnaround look at field results. And I believe it, it provides an, int an intelligent starting point for more elaborate modeling and inversion. But uh, for my final conclusion, I just want to uh, show you this. And I think this is, this is a good view of the big picture. Current state of the yard on the left, and this is a big bucket. It includes ground, airborne, grounded wire source, loop source, et cetera. In short, everything in current practice. More or less, we go, we get our data. There may be some uh, 
data processing done to, to uh, get our um, results in, in good form, dealing with noise, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, we go straight into data analysis and we're dealing with an, uh, a diffuse EM field structure where our TEM information is highly mixed. Now on the right uh, is an addition to the state of the art. And I put a question mark on that because as, as is always the case, it's, it's uh, really TBD. Will this, will this happen or not? It, that decision is made by a larger group of people in a more collective way. But we're certainly going to see changes in, in uh, the data that we acquire if we're going to do this. It's multi-source and high-density TEM data. And uh, on the, we add a completely new step here, which is the interferographic processing to do beamforming. And there are similar techniques that can be envisioned as well. And then we're putting that into our data analysis, uh, which may well contain um, differences to what is being done currently. The important point is the change in EM field structure, which is now localized after doing this style of processing and the degree of uh, information unmixing provided. And I think that's the major contrast with the current state of the art. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'd love to hear from everybody about your assessment of this, as well as the presentation. It, it's valuable for improving both. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you, positive, neutral, negative, and uh, most especially, why. So thank you very much. Mike. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. Uh, very much appreciated. We see, I see some uh, questions already coming in here. I'd very much encourage folks, if you have a question, to raise your hand, and then we can unmute you and you can ask it directly. Um, otherwise, you can ask your question uh, in the chat or Q&A. Um, and Brian, we can maybe stop your screen share so we're not looking at the, the oh, Zoom sorry. window of me. <laughs> That's all right. Um, and yeah. so I'll uh, unmute uh, Dennis here and invite him to jump in better? with his question. Yes, that looks good. All right, so uh, Dennis, feel free to uh, unmute and turn on your camera uh, if you like. Um, have I been unmuted? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay, good. Brian, good to... Uh talk to you and actually see you again. Excellent yeah. presentation, Brian. Thank you. And it's really good to see that you're continuing this research. I have a few <clears throat> questions. I think we, um, we might have discussed earlier when we talked of a practical nature, because where I'd like to apply this is to um, mineral exploration, deep mineral exploration. Sure. Uh, because we use, you know, fairly large sources. Mm -hmm. like, you know, for a very practical level, just how do you um, how do you optimize the spatial separation and the number of ground sources for a given geologic problem? You've been using 13 and 10, but I'm wondering how you and a separation of 800 meters. But is it is it a function of the resistivity of a uniform or layered earth, or are you I think it's a function of the scale of the problem uh, spatially. Um, you know, if you're looking at deep targets, um, you're probably going to need to be looking at ones that are uh, relatively large enough to, to make a, an impact. Um, and, and you're going to size the, the overall scale of the survey. I, I think you need an extent at least uh, three times the scale length of the feature you're, you're trying to, to get at. And, and the depth to that is also part of that uh, consideration. And I think then the, the, um, the separation of the sources probably falls out of that naturally. I do think something on the order of 10 is about right in terms of uh, maintaining uh, quality of result versus the cost of adding sources. Um, once you drop significantly below 10, the, the, uh, the processing result starts to degrade. And um, I don't think there's a lot of value from having a lot more than 10. Um, so I, so it's kind could, of um, where the knee so and the curve is. Down to five? 
perhaps? Five is probably not going to be sufficient. It, um, you're probably going to start to have uh, 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 negative effects on, on the uh, interferographic processing. You'll still get something out of that. It's just going to be uh, degraded um, compared to what you would get if you doubled from five to ten. I've looked at that sort of thing. One of the one of the things I've done is I've looked a lot at at source density, and I, that's how I've arrived at this this number around approximately ten, which might be you know. Um, eight or nine up to 12, 13 in that range would be the sweet spot, I would say. Right. Well, from my perspective, that's where this, um, your technique um, has some downfalls because it's just not practical on a, on a large scale survey in the bush in Northern Canada to be doing a repeating survey five times. You'll never convince a client to do that. Uh, you might, you might be able to get them to do it twice or three times, but, uh, I can see where your technique is really useful for shallow work, for engineering type <clears throat> exploration, where it's very quick and to you know, put in another receiver transmitter and, and run the survey again. You can do that in, in a couple hours, but uh, for a you know big operation in a remote location, it's just not going to work. Comments? Ah, uh, well, uh, yeah. Um... We'll have to see how it all evolves over time. Um, I, you know, if if um, if we have hard time getting information at in these deeper problems, if we have a hard time getting adequate information, well, uh, that starts to argue in favor of doing more in the field to see if we can get get better information that that crosses our threshold for becoming adequate. Um, so we'll see how the economics of all of this will play out over time. I, it's difficult for me to predict. Every time I try to look into a crystal ball, I really get it wrong every time. So, Yeah, we need to find a client who has a really um, difficult problem, and they really want uh, high resolution mm -hmm. and deep drilling for very, very rich targets. If you can find yeah. such a client, I think you might be able to sell perhaps three maybe five surveys over an area mm -hmm. to try your technique out. But um, for mineral exploration, I think that's, uh, that, that's, that's the ideal. Okay, I'll unmute. Thank you again for the talk, it's great. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I see an another question here in the uh, Q&A. Um, Kwame is asking about the um, the geologic sort of model and motivation for the example where you had the horse and basin, sort of what uh, geologic units you perhaps have in mind. Um, and specifically, they're interested in looking at groundwater exploration. And so perhaps you can comment on any thoughts you might have in the context of groundwater. Yeah, I think uh, groundwater problems are certainly a, a, a target problem area for a technique like this. It depends on the resolution you need. I, 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 um, I don't know that this is going to get applied where you get um, good results or good enough results with existing capabilities in general. I think uh, it's, it's where you need um, better answers. And um, the, the examples I chose are just, you know, sort of classic structural models, uh, a basement high or, or a buried basin. Um, I, you know, I, I happen to think the, the structural problem um, is probably um, maybe a little bit better target set than, than classic mining problems of, of uh, individual conductors in an otherwise very resistive uh, uh, host. Um, I largely view, you know, there's, there's a lot of techniques been, that have been developed in that arena. And um, I'm not sure um, in most cases they, that they get the job done. They are, they're, they're, they're good enough in most cases. There may be some cases where, that, where we're getting into much deeper exploration where something more may be required. But I think there's a, there's a range of, of areas, geothermal, groundwater, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that um, could benefit from this sort of approach. 
and as I mentioned, you know, the uh, definitely the the number of sources drives a, a survey cost up, which is why I believe that uh, commercialization will will really depend on the use of drones. The the use of drones really helps to drive the cost per data point way down, and I think that helps to balance things out. All right. Thanks, Brian. Sure. Are there folks with other other questions? We'll invite a few more. I actually um, had another question for you. Um, you mentioned and illustrated how important the background uh, model is in being able to estimate that. So in practice, mm -hmm. that's not something we often know. Um, right. How would you how would you plan to approach that in general? Well, this is what I arrived at. I, I've gone to um, using a gradual. Uh, layered model. So I use the, I would use the acquired data and at each time I would um, find a half space, equivalent half space um, that best fits that profile at that time. So a, as a function of time, I end up with a sequence of different half space, uh, um, uh, equivalent half spaces to represent that. So if I have a grounded bar source, I would be fitting to the HX data doing that. If it were loop sources, I'd be using the HZ data. Uh, I can then translate uh, that sequence of half space models versus time into, a, into uh, uh, a resistivity versus depth model. And that's what I've done in these examples. And that's what I would do in general so that I don't actually have to know specifically a lot of things about the medium. That would be the starting point. And then as, as processing uh, went along, um, then, or as uh, uh, um, a, a target area became better understood, you could start to build more elaborate models and use those as your reference model. And you're looking then to refine your understanding of, of the environment you're dealing with. But just a, if you're totally blind going in, that, the process I just outlined is what I would do that becomes really um, applicable to any any particular to any uh, survey. I don't have to have prior knowledge at that point. Okay. Thanks, Brian. I see another question here from uh, Sid Visser. Uh, would all of the sources have to have exactly the same waveform and timing? Hmm, that would sure be nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there could certainly be uh, uh, various complications that could arise that you may have to deal with in processing. We may have to, you may have to get into, if you have different uh, uh, waveforms, you may have to first be going through deconvolution then so that you, you, get, you get those differences out of the way. Um, I would certainly hope that, uh, um, you can get the, the same time range of interest out of, out of each source. Um, I think it's frankly possible to do data acquisition in the frequency domain. If you have enough uh, range in frequency, you can do uh, a Fourier transformation then to the time domain. Um, and I think that's a very viable technique. Um, that, that's just a, a, a straightforward digital filtering operation. If you have enough span in the frequency uh, data to, to provide the coverage, the support you need for the time domain uh, range that you want. Right. So I think there's a variety of ways to, to, to get the data we need. Um, so I think probably there's a, a, a bit of, uh, of latitude in what we can be doing in the field and still get to results that we can, we can work with. Thanks, Brian. Sure. Perfect. All right. Well, I don't see too many more questions popping in, but I'm sure um, if you've got follow-up questions, you can reach out to Brian uh, and connect that way. Um, mm -hmm. And so the video, the recording will be posted in um, a few hours. We'll get that up on YouTube and on the MTNet um, website. And Brian, if you'd be happy to share your slides, we can post those as well if you would like. Yeah, I provided those uh, uh, yesterday evening to Alan. Excellent. So, All right. Um, he, he, ar he already has those. So they, Perfect. Can, be, well, uh, well, they can be posted uh, whenever you want. 
All right. Well, we'll get those get those up for everyone. So um, thanks again, everyone. And we'll hope to see you again uh, next week. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.